In this video, I'm going to show you the many ways that I use washes and shades. Hi everyone and welcome to another brushstroke painting guide. So as you heard from the intro there, the topic for this video is going to be looking at using acrylic washes and shades on your miniatures. So I guess the first thing we need to establish is what are washes and shades? And if you're new to the hobby, this can actually be quite confusing because so many different products and so many different manufacturers out there use different terms to mean the same thing. So for example, if you look at the first one here, we've got Games Workshop, it calls that a shade. And then next to that, we've got two thin coats and they call theirs a wash. And then the Army Painter, they're calling theirs a quick shade, but then also on the bottle, they call it an ink. And then Vallejo, we're back to it being called a wash. Pro Acryl, they're calling theirs transparent. And then moving on, we've got newer types of shading paints, which are the speed paints and contrast. So we've got Games Workshop with their contrast paint. We've got the Army Painter with their speed paints. And then Scale 75, they've got their instant range. And Scale 75 also have their Inktensive, which is um, more like a traditional sort of artist ink. And then right at the end, you can use artist inks as well. Nice and confusing then. Maybe the best place to start would just be to have a look at what they do and we can worry about what to call them at the end. So let's take the chainmail on this model as an example. I've base coated it with a nice bright silver, but it looks quite flat. There's no shadow or shading to it. Now I could take a darker gray or even a darker silver and add that into all the little holes and the little gaps between those rings and add shadow that way. Or instead, what I could do is I could apply a black wash all over the chainmail and let it do all the work for me. And then once it's dry, you can see what it's actually done is it's darkened down all those gaps like I wanted, but while still keeping all of the rings of the chainmail bright by comparison. All with very little effort from me whatsoever. And that's what shades or washes are for. They're a quick and easy way of adding shadow and depth to your miniatures. But in order to know how best to use them, we're going to need to take a look at how they actually work. So let's imagine then that this shape represents the chainmail texture on my model. And the raised areas are the rings of the chainmail and then I've got the gaps in between each ring. And then as I applied the wash to the chainmail, you'll remember that it was very fluid-like, almost like a coloured water. And it's because of that fluidity that it very quickly filled in those gaps and very little of it was left on the raised surfaces. Which meant when it dried, the concentration of it was in the gaps which gave a darker result and only a very subtle tinting to the raised areas. And it's this free-flowing fluidity which is a key characteristic to washes because they're actually formulated to behave in this way so that they'll flow freely into gaps and recesses and details of your model and resist settling on the higher areas. Now, those of you who have already watched my How to Thin Your Paints video will remember that I described these characteristics as the paint's speed and I plotted washes and shades at the fast end of that speed scale because they have those characteristics of flowing easily, moving quickly and lower opacity. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, then there's a link to that video at the top of the screen now and I've also listed it in the description below. Well, in that video, I observed that the more a paint is thinned down, the more movement or speed the paint takes on and the more it wants to run off angled surfaces and settle in gaps and recesses. So effectively, what washes are, are paints that are thinned sufficiently to maximize this behavior, resist the raised surfaces and settle in the recesses. So does that mean because all of these products share that characteristic that makes them all the same? Well, not quite, no, because all of these products also have another characteristic which sets them apart from each other, and that's their potency or concentration. And that difference can be really useful for the ways that you can use them. So we saw with the chainmail example that applying that wash over the base coated silver resulted in the recesses being darkened and the higher points remaining relatively unaffected. And that's because the wash used in that case was of a fairly weak potency and only produced a heavy darkening where it collected most, i.e. in the gaps between the rings. If you increase the potency of a wash though, the result is it starts to behave more like a dye and will actually stain the higher points too. 
and this is where the newer speed paints and contrast paints come in. They've taken the characteristics of a wash and added in the ability to also stain the raised areas too, effectively allowing you not only the ability to add shading and shadows, but also colour the surface as well, all in one step. Let's take a look at a couple of examples to show you how that could be really helpful. Starting off then with a simple white primed dungeon door and now I'm going to apply a basic Games Workshop shade wash, I think this is Agrax Earthshade and as you might expect it's behaving exactly as the wash did on the chainmail, it's flowing easily into all of those recesses and the creases but it's having pretty much little to no effect on the raised surfaces so it's remaining pretty untouched with a very light tint of brown. And when it's dry, it's exactly the same story as it was with the chainmail. It's darkened down all those recesses and those grooves, and it's very lightly tinted those raised areas. But what if I wanted the result to be a brown door with darker shadows? Well, one option is I could start with a brown base coat and then apply that same low potency shade wash, Agrax Earthshade, over the top and it would do exactly what we'd expect. It would darken down those recesses and apply a slight brown tint to the raised areas, giving a finished dried result looking like this. Okay then, so let's repeat the first step that we did, but this time let's use a brown wash which has a high potency. In this particular case I'm going to use a Games Workshop contrast paint. Now in many ways it's behaving exactly the same way as the first wash did. It has the same characteristics of being fast moving and free flowing and it wants to settle into all of those details and recesses. But it does have one fundamental difference and that's it's also staining those top surfaces brown as well. So it's that potency or concentration of the wash which is also making it behave like a dye and staining that white primer brown. And if we let this dry we can see that the end result is actually a brown door with darker shadows in those recesses. So in one step we've gone from a completely white primed door to not only having shadows and shade but also having that colour added to the raised surfaces as well. Which means we can see from the results that the first wash added dark brown shading to the recesses and grooves whilst adding a light brown tint to the raised areas of the two doors we applied it to first. Whereas the second wash produced a similar effect on the recesses but also stained the raised areas with a much stronger tint of brown. Which means we can consider washes as being in a range of potency or concentration, ranging from weaker washes such as Games Workshop Shades and Army Painters Quick Shades, through to really concentrated and potent washes such as Games Workshop's Contrasts and Army Painters Speed Paints, even up to pure artist inks themselves. The stronger the wash's potency, the more it will stain the surface it is applied to. Now, before we get too carried away with strong washes and their cool ability to both stain and shade, there is an important key factor that we also need to bear in mind in order to use them effectively, and that is the base colour they are applied on top of. Staining and potency shouldn't be confused with coverage and opacity. As we've already established, a characteristic of a heavily thinned paint is it will always have a degree of transparency, and strong washes are no exception. For strong washes to work effectively, they need to be applied over a white or very pale base colour. Take our door example. If I'd applied the same contrast brown wash over a black primer instead, the result would have been quite different. As you can see, the wash is still going on just as it did before and it's trying to flow into those recesses, but because the colour underneath is so dark, the difference between the shaded areas and the stained raised areas is almost non-existent. And when the contrast wash is fully dry, that's still the case. There's no real difference between the recessed areas and the raised areas. It's basically just a single dark brown colour. So that's definitely something that we need to bear in mind. The colour that we're painting our wash on top of has a massive effect to the end result we're going to get. Okay, so now we have a better idea of what washes do and how their potency will affect their end result, I think it would be useful for us to take a look at some general tips on how best to apply them. 
Starting off then with rule number one, and that is always shake your washes. Now this is a rule that applies to all paints, but especially to washes, because they have a lot of ingredients which, when left unattended, will tend to separate and split out, especially if you take a look at some contrast paints. If you turn them over, you'll notice there's a sort of a sediment or um, a buildup at the bottom of the bottle. Now that needs to be mixed in. Never try and use a contrast paint where you can see that at the bottom. Always shake it and then shake it some more until it is complete completely gone and only then is it right to use. My next tip for applying washes is to work in logical sections. What I mean by this is break the mini up into smaller areas which you can work on and then leave to dry as you continue to apply the wash to the next section. The reason this is important is because you don't want to overwork the wash by running your brush through areas where the wash has already started to dry. Working in small sections and then moving on massively reduces this risk of disturbing drying areas and creating uneven shading or ugly blobs in your wash. For example, on this model I can take an armour panel at a time. Starting at one end, I can apply the wash and begin to persuade the wash to settle into the areas I want with my brush and keep working across the panel so as to not disturb the wash as I go. By working in this way, it also means that the wet edge of the wash doesn't get a chance to start drying and form any ugly tide marks, because I'm always working with it and moving it and encouraging it to settle to the edges and inner details. This is especially important when applying washes to areas like this, which are very smooth and don't have a lot of texture. The next tip is very important, gravity use it, don't fight it. As we've already seen, washes are very fluid and will flow over a surface and want to settle into any grooves and recesses, but that movement and settlement is dictated by the pull of gravity. So far better for us to use that to pull the wash where we want it to go and not to try to defy it. A perfect example for this would be a cloak. So let's say that we want to add some shadows between each fold of this cloak. We could easily apply a wash to each fold by simply running it down each one and it would look fine. Except in this case we have the cloak stood up and the direction of gravity is actually pulling to the base of the cloak. And all that will happen is that the free flowing wash will happily flow down each fold and settle in puddles at the bottom. Not really what we had in mind. A far better solution would be to orientate the cloak so that gravity is actually pulling the wash into the bottom of each fold instead. That way, when I apply my wash, it will just settle into the bottom of each of those folds and I can encourage it and persuade it to go to exactly where I want it to, knowing that it's not going to move anywhere else while it's drying. And once you've decided upon the orientation of the piece you're painting, stick to it. Try your best to not change the direction of gravity by moving the model around as you're applying the wash because all you'll end up doing is causing the wash that's on the model's surface to move and slosh around, which is a recipe for disaster, as you could end up with an uneven finish, blotchy or patchy shading, or worse, you could run wet wash into already drying wash and that could disturb it and clump it together. So do your best to keep the piece that you're painting pointing in the same direction at all times. The next tip is the potency of a wash needn't be a set thing. You don't just have to use it as it comes in the bottle. You can change its potency to suit your needs. Just like any paint, you can thin washes down and in doing so you'll weaken its potency, thus decreasing its staining strength and increasing its transparency. So thinning washes is just the same as thinning paints. For example, I'll just take some contrast wash here and put that onto my palette. And yes, you can use washes and contrasts on your wet palette. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't. They're just paints at the end of the day. In fact, if you'd like some more tips on using wet palettes, then you can check out the video I've made on using them by clicking the link above. Unlike thinning paints, however, I strongly recommend that you thin washes only with their corresponding medium. In this case, I'm using contrast medium. Washes have quite unique formulations and their respective mediums share that same formula, just without any colour pigment. If you were to thin your washes with water, you will upset that balance and risk the wash splitting and no longer maintaining its integrity. The result of which is it won't perform correctly. It will apply unevenly and streak and dry patchy and blotchy. Thinning your washes is also a great idea if you're wanting to use them on large smooth areas. 
By reducing the potency and applying as multiple layers, you'll have more control and achieve smoother results with less tide marks, blotchiness, etc. And the final tip is probably the most simple. Test your wash before you apply it to your mini. It sounds so obvious, but just by simply testing the wash on your palette or on the back of your hand over the dry color you're about to apply it to can be so valuable. That test will quickly show you how potent your wash is going to be and whether you've got your ratios right, all without risking ruining your miniature. So why risk it? Always test your washes. Now with all of those tips brimming in our minds, let's take a look at some different ways in which washes can be used on our miniatures. Starting off with probably the most simple of all the applications, an all over wash of a single color. So I've quickly base coated this Goblin Mini with a few different base colors and I'm going to apply an all over wash of a low potency brown wash straight from the pot. Because I'm using the same color wash for the whole model, I don't have to worry about where I'm placing it. I just need to concentrate on getting an even coverage across the whole of the Mini and make sure the wash doesn't pull up in any areas I don't want it. If it does, I can just wick it back up again with my brush and carry on applying it elsewhere on the Mini. And when it's dried, it looks pretty cool to be fair. The advantages of this method are that it's quick and easy and it produces an earthy, grimy look, which is good if you're wanting a grimy look. The disadvantages with it are for it to work well, you're limited to using pretty dull colours or tones like browns, greys and blacks, which can make the Mini very dull looking. But what if you wanted brighter colours or different tones for different colours on a Mini? Well then you can use separate coloured washes for different colours. So I've base coated another Goblin Mini but I've used exactly the same base colours as I did on the previous one and this time instead of using just one wash all over I'm going to use a green wash on the green skin, a red wash on his tunic, a black wash on the metallics, a blue wash on his feathers and so on. The immediate difference with this method is that it requires far more care to be taken when applying the washes to make sure they're only applied in the right places, especially if you're using potent staining washes over a light base colour. Any mistakes there will require corrections and paint overs in order to cover over those mistakes. But the end result is far more vibrant and colourful than the previous method. The advantages of using multiple washes are really it provides for far greater choice and variation of colour and tone on the Mini and ultimately total artistic freedom. The disadvantages are the increase in care required for the applications which then increases the time it takes to do which is further increased by the longer drying times needed for multiple washes to dry. There will be times when you want to have full control of your shading placement or you only want your shading to be in the recesses and panel gaps of your miniature. For these occasions you can use a process called recess shading or it's sometimes called pin shading. The process is very straightforward but it does require a large amount of care to be taken to ensure the wash is applied in the correct areas. In this example, I'm wanting to darken down the grooves, the vents and recesses on the armour panels, but not the armour itself. So I'm using a smaller brush so as to not accidentally flood the area I'm working on, and I'm just letting the wash run from the very tip of the brush into those recesses. Now I'm trying to be as careful as I can, but mistakes will obviously happen, but that's okay. You just need to let that wash dry and then you can go back and correct any mistakes that you make with the appropriate base paint colour afterwards. The advantages of this method are it enables incredibly focused and targeted shading to exact areas of the Mini. It's particularly effective on models with large flat surfaces as it avoids applying washes on them at all, thus removing the risk of any ugly tide marks and streaks etc. The disadvantages are it does require significant care when applying, which leads to a longer painting process, especially if on top of that there are still mistakes of corrections to be made and tidied up at the end. As we've already seen, potent washes are great because they have that ability to stain the surface like a dye. Well, we can take advantage of that trait and we can use it to tint our minis as well. In this example, I've painted my Mini with a base coat cream colour, shaded the recesses and even added a highlight to the edges. 
And now, using a thinned down contrast yellow wash, I'm going to tint all of it a lovely bright yellow. Because washes have that level of transparency, it means the different tones from the highlights and the shading will still be visible through the wash, but now there'll be tones of yellow instead of creams and browns. Tinting colours like this is a great way to paint bright and difficult colours like yellows, as the shading and highlighting can all be done in advance. Other examples where you could use this tinting method would be for, say, painting illuminated buttons or lamps. By simply painting them with a bright white first and then applying a tint of a potent wash over the top will give a great glowing effect. The disadvantages of this method are really the same as any of the other colour specific methods we've looked at already. The overall painting takes a little longer and needs a little bit more care. Incidentally, if you'd like to see the whole process for painting this yellow from beginning to end, then you can watch the whole video by clicking the link above or I've listed it in the description below. And for my final example method of applying washes, I thought I'd include something called zenithal pre-shading. So if you're not familiar with the concept of zenithal pre-shading, I'll give you a quick rundown of the basics. Starting with your miniature, you prime it or base coat it all over in black and then from an angle above of around 45 degrees, you spray a light gray or a white, and that will fall on all the raised areas and pick out all those details on the miniature, whilst leaving the underside and recesses, etc. colored black, effectively creating a realistic looking shading and highlighting all over the miniature. Now, if you don't have an airbrush or a rattle can to hand to be able to do this zenithal spray, you can actually replicate the process by using dry brushing, and I believe that process is now called slap chop. So you dry brush it all over to pick out those details in a lighter tone and create the shadows underneath, giving an overall effect very similar to the zenithal spray. So how does this apply to washes and shades? Well, if we take the tinting method that we've just looked at, and this time include both the staining and shading properties of a potent wash, like contrast and speed paints. We can combine everything we've looked at in this video and distill it into a single process by simply applying a potent red wash over this zenithal shaded miniature. I can achieve a coloured, shaded and highlighted red armour all in one step. Now, you will need to take extra care to only get the wash on the areas that you want because trying to correct a zenithal undercoat is very tricky, I can tell you. But I think you'll agree the end result is well worth that extra little bit of care. To be able to achieve highlighting and shading like this in a single step, I think is really cool. Again, if you'd like to see the full painting process for this mini, you can just by clicking the link above or in the description below. Okay, so let me try and sum everything up as a bit of a reminder of the things to think about when using washes. Firstly, think about the result that you're wanting and which method will achieve that best for you. A single colour all over wash is great for quick and simple results, especially if you're after a more muted and grimy look, as a brown wash is perfect for that. For punchier colours or to shade multiple colours on a miniature, including using potent staining washes directly on a white primer, then the colour specific method is a good method to use. For more focused and targeted shading to specific areas such as recesses, then recess shading is the method I would choose, especially if it avoids having to apply washes over large flat surfaces. For painting bright and troublesome colours like yellow, then I highly recommend using the tinting method. And for a quick and effective way to achieve eye-catching highlighting and shading in a single step, then using a potent wash over a zenithal pre-shade is a great option. And don't forget, whichever method you choose when using washes, always shake your washes. You decide the potency you want your wash to have. And like paints, applying multiple thin coats will result in a smoother, cleaner result, especially when applying over smooth flat surfaces. Remember to always test your washes first so you know exactly what you're going to get. Use gravity to your advantage and keep the miniature orientated the same way as you apply your washes. And finally, apply the washes methodically across your minis to avoid disturbing areas which have already started to dry. Oh, and one last thing, always make sure your washes are fully dry before moving on to that next stage of painting. 
Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you have, then please do give it a like. If you'd like to see more of these videos and have any suggestions on videos you'd like me to make, then please do drop a comment below. If you have enjoyed this video, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button and supporting the channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell to be told whenever I post another video. And finally, I'd love it if you stayed on the channel and checked out some more of my videos. So how about another of my painting foundation videos? or perhaps my latest painting video where you can see the techniques from this video in action.